every voice and sing till earth and heaven ring ring with the harmonies of liberty let our rejoicing rise high as the listening skies let it resound loud as the rolling sea sing a song full of the faith that the dark past has taught us sing a song full of the hope that the present has brought us facing the rising sun of a new day begun let us march on till victory is won stony the road we trod bitter the chastening rod felt in the days when hope unborn had died yet with a steady beat have not a weary feet come to the place for which our father sighed we have come over a way that with tears has been watered we have come treading the path through the blood of the slaughtered out from the gloomy past till now we stand at last where the white gleam of a bright star is cast god of our weary years god of our silent tears thou who hast brought us thus far on our way thou who hast by thy might led us into the light keep us forever in the path we pray lest our feet stray from the places our god where we met thee lest our hearts drunk with the wine of the world we forget thee shadowed beneath thy hand may we forever stand true to our god true to our native land i'm, I'm black and i'm proud it's, you know we all should be proud of our color Black pride should be a part of our being. The strength and innovation that comes out of our struggle to survive is black pride. The cultural pride is, is about self-love at a, at a very basic level to me. And um, just loving who you are, loving where you've come from. And I get up every day grateful to have all this melanin. So I stand on the shoulders of uh, family members who um, 
their family members grew up on plantations, um, worked four or five jobs, I'm first generation everything. Um, and I still give back to my family because that's how important it is to stand on the shoulders of somebody else. We should be free, free like a bird, do everything that we want to do and can do. We're not going to let anything stop us. Black pride, black freedom, that is there. I've taken those things no one else wanted and turned them into something so significant that they are copied. Other days, this is a day when African Americans were actually freed, even though their freedom was at a cost. Understanding where our past, where we've come from, I think is extremely important as a people. It helps us to remember the things that we had to overcome to be where we are. Uh, it's, a, it's about loving yourself. Well, it's an opportunity for me to honor my ancestors. We just have to keep on reaching, searching, believing in ourselves. But the whole nation should be celebrating that they finally let the African Americans go who they enslaved who helped to build this country. My name is Gloria Duquette and I'm a CNA. Um, we're here to send a message to, to Ned Lamont to let him know that we had enough. We had enough. Two long black women, brown women, and men are dying. You see, the problem is that they're talking about the pandemic that started last year. But we have a pandemic a long time ago. Yeah. This is not new. The pandemic is not new to us. We work, I work three jobs and I'm surviving. And I work four jobs. So when we, we cannot buy food, we can't pay our bills, we have to borrow from Peter to pay Paul. Tired. We are tired. When the pandemic came, we didn't stop working. We showed up. They stayed home in their mansion and they work from home. We could not do patient care from home. So we showed up. And the fact that we showed up, they need to show up. You see, the, um, we say Black Lives Matter. Yes, we do. Yes, we do. And we are proud to say Black Lives Matter because our fellow died on the street. It's not only that when we say Black Lives Matter, it's because of what's going on on the street. But I watch my Black mothers sit in the nursing home. I watch my Black sisters sit in the nursing home and they cannot afford their work 80 hours, 100 to go to the doctor. They can't. So Black Lives Matter because when they go to the doctor, all the doctor co pay, they don't have it. They can't afford it while working 100 hours. So we are here today to send a message to DSS and to send a message to the governor that matters. And we, we demand that he pay us a livable wage. And we are asking him, take your knee out of our neck. Um, happy Juneteenth to everyone. You know, I'm so happy to be a part of um, to be a part of this celebration today. Um, the, I don't know if you're hearing me, but my because my internet is just stopped working, not working good for some reason. Okay. My name is Gloria Duquette. I'm a delegate, certified nursing assistant at Kimberly All South in Windsor and St. Mary's Home in Hartford County. And yet, leaders in the state of Connecticut to take your knee off our neck. 
I felt so happy to be a part of this historical day and to share with my sisters and brothers at SEIU 1199, New England. Today, we celebrate a great victory. Thanks to our power in unity, our power as hardworking men and women, our power as Black, Latino, Asian, and white workers united for livable wages and benefits, for for quality services for the people we care for, our power to make sure we make this happen with an urgency of justice. I work three jobs and I'm here like many of you after a long day's work and after we're done here, I'll be going to my next shift this evening. But as a proud member of SEIU 1199, last year, this time, many of us didn't know the history of June 19. But when we started reading and learning a little more, we found out that this is a historical day. We knew we needed Juneteenth as a holiday into federal law. Joining us today from North Carolina for this first Juneteenth holiday celebration is Reverend Dr. William J. Barber from Repairers of the Breach and Poor People Campaign. Following the footstep of Martin Luther King Jr., the list of achievements and pending struggles is quite long. And we at 1199 New England are very excited to listen live today to this keynote speech. Welcome Reverend Dr. Barber to 1199 New England and rest assured that when we fight, we win. Thank you all. Happy Juneteenth, everyone. Thank you. Great. Well, I'm certainly glad to be with, always with SEI 1199, wherever you are in the world, because wherever you are, you all are doing tremendous work. And I'm so thankful for the more than 25,000 uh, workers um, that are represented up in the Northeast. I'm also thankful that you understand that uh, while it is a good thing to have Juneteenth as a national holiday, uh, what is really the most important thing is the work you all do and the work you have done in fighting for essential workers, especially in nursing homes and places where during this pandemic, they've been especially vulnerable and dead and, and a face death. And I know you lost a number of members um, and you chose to fight for a bill of rights uh, that's what's most important, a Bill of Rights. And you did so with every moral means possible to you, even civil disobedience when necessary. And that's kind of what I want to talk about. Let me turn this air conditioner down, make sure you're not hearing it. Uh, what I want to say something about today on this Juneteenth, I've really been struggling with it to some degree. And um, I come out of a faith tradition. Uh, and we talk about this in the Poor People's Campaign, the National Call for a Moral Revival and also in the uh, repairs of the breach that I lead, that really doesn't allow me to use uh, the word celebration as much as use the word holy days or commemorations or convocations or consecrations. And I've been thinking about, can you cut this air off? I've been thinking about the scripture that says in the Bible, in the, in, in the book of Joshua, where Joshua commanded the priest to go down in the Jordan River and to take 12 stones and to and take 12 stones out of the river Jordan and then to, to stack them on the side of the river. And somebody said, well, what does all this mean? And Joshua said, it means that in the future, when your children ask their parents, what do these stones mean? You can tell them Israel crossed the Jordan on dry ground for the Lord your God dried up the Jordan before you until you had crossed over. In other words, what the stones were meant to do was to be a historical reminder of how God is always on the side of liberation so that as the children continue to face 
of the challenges they would look back at that day and those stones and understand that they could remember but it must always be the kind of remembrance that says to them because you remember is the reason you can never relax or retreat when it comes to standing against injustice. And in a real sense, I hope that that's really what this Juneteenth, uh, I want to say commemoration is really about. It should be a time when we reconsecrate ourselves. We remember, but we only remember because we are clear. The remembrance helps to make it clear to us that in the face of current realities, we cannot ever, we can never relax or retreat. What was American chattel slavery? You know, we people want to run and talk about Juneteenth, but but what before you can even talk about Juneteenth, what was American chattel slavery? You know, it was unique to America because it was a form of human bondage where black slaves, and it was dictated by color. Tahishi Coates says that. Systemic racism is the father of race. There was a decision that there needed to be free labor. Uh, and it could not be the kind of free labor that connected white and black people together because they might join together and rebel like they did in the Bacon's Rebellion in 1619. So there needed to be free labor. But that free labor had to be designated by race. And it had to be designated by inhumanity because those who would do the labor would have to be deemed non-citizens, which means they would have to in some ways be deemed non-human or less human because you could not enslave citizens. And so the decision was made, once the decision was made to engage in systemic racism and to have an economic system driven by free labor designated toward a certain people, the decision was made that race came into being. And so that skin color was greater than one's humanity and greater than citizenship. And skin color would automatically identify you from birth as being a candidate for chattel slavery. And what was chattel slavery? Chattel slavery was making people property, saying that people are just the same as furniture or livestock. She is unique form of, of, of slavery, this American slavery. Black people were violently torn from their motherland of Africa and sold into slavery like livestock for over 240 years. And it was perpetual. The children of the slaves were automatically slaves themselves. The slaves were a part of the slave owner's estate. And slaves were insured, just like today, you insure your car, or you insure your house, or you insure a racehorse. They were insured just like property. In fact, just streets away from the current site of the New York Stock Exchange, men and women and children were bought and sold. I like to say this because we often relegate slavery to just being um, something that happened in the South. I heard a black person the other day say that slavery was not an American problem. It only occurred in certain parts of the country. It was something America tolerated. No, slavery was America. Right near the New York Stock Exchange, Exchange, men and women and children were bought and sold. Slavery, one article says, thrived under the colonial rule. British and Dutch settlers relied on enslaved people to establish farms and to build new homes and the cities that would eventually become the United States. Enslaved people, black people, were brought to work on the cotton and sugar and tobacco plantations and the crops they grew were sent to Europe or to other Northern colonies to be turned into finished products. And then those finished goods were used to fund more trips to Africa 
to obtain more slaves who would then traffic it back to America. So in a real sense, what we call today the American New York Stock Exchange directly traces back to slavery in all of its wealth and money. In fact, in the 19th century, US banks and Southern states would sell securities to help them fund and expand slave run plantation. And in order to balance the risk that would come with forcibly bringing human beings from Africa to America, they had insurance policies on their cargo. And these policies protected against the risk of a boat sinking and the risk of losing their cargo, their chattel, once they made it or before they made it to America. And some of the largest insurance firms in the US, New York Life, AIG, Aetna, sold policies that ensured slave owners would be compensated if the slaves they own were injured or killed. We don't often talk about this, but we must. What was slavery? The money that Southern plantation owners earned couldn't be kept under their mattresses or under the floorboards. So American banks were a part of the slave system. They accepted the deposits and counted enslaved people as assets when assessing a person's wealth. And in recent years, US banks have made public, some of them, their role. JP Morgan Chase, currently the biggest bank in the US that we've often saved. Uh, two of its subsidiaries, Citizens Bank and Canal Bank in Louisiana, all accepted enslaved people as collateral for loans. In other words, if you wanted to buy a house, you could go down and offer up your slaves as a, as a collateral for a loan. And if pl plantation owners defaulted on the loan, the payment the banks took, for payment, the banks took ownership of the slaves and then the banks then sold the slave, just like you sell a repossessed car. JP Morgan was not alone. Bank of America, Citibank are also among those who are well-known US financial firms that benefited from the slavery, slave trade. So slavery was an overwhelmingly important fact in the American economy. There would not be an American economy. You would not, America would have never been able to, to get, to have a better, a strong economy than countries in Europe and Africa that were tens of thousands of years older than them without 240 years of free labor. Slavery was sustained by violence because the violence was protecting folks' money. And you know, on the back of the dollar bill, it says, in God we trust, but you also know to protect that money, we'll go to war, even as a nation. Slavery was sustained by lynching and whipping and raping and reproducing and breeding human beings, just like animals. In fact, in 1840, most of America's churches split over the issue of slavery. That's how you got the Northern Presbyterians and the Southern Presbyterians and the Northern Baptist Church and the American Baptist Church. And then in 1861, there was a national split that led to a civil war. And think about it, slavery forced it so that we had to get an order from a president to, ha in, to have in America what God already had provided us as human beings. Slavery was free labor, was the goal. And seven to six, five things undergirded slavery. Evil economics, the means, the end justifies the means. Sick sociology, some people have to be below other people. Um, political pathology, where everything you do, every constitution you write has to first take in consideration how it protects slavery. Um, heretical ontology. And that is that God intended this, it was God ordained. And then bad biology, that you can determine brain size by, you can determine brain capacity by skin color. 
You can read a lot of this in a book called Prophesied Deliverance by Cornell West. Slavery was the means to the goal of economic prosperity. Race was the only way that, to ensure that slavery only occurred to one people. Everything America did when she sat down to create it, Declaration of Independence, Constitution, always had to ask in the back room, how will this impact us keeping our slaves? Thurgood Marshall, when he argued the case before the Supreme Court, declaring that separate but equal was unconstitutional, said these final words. Nobody will stand in the court and argue that, and in order to arrive at the decision that they want us to arrive at, there would have to be some recognition of a reason why of all the multitudinous groups of people in this country, you have singled out the Negro to give him separate treatment. It can't be because slavery of slavery in the past, because there were very few groups in this country that haven't had slavery at some place back in their history. It can't be color because these are Negro, these are Negroes, Negroes and whites as, as excuse me, Negro, excuse me, because he said, because there are Negroes as white as the drifted snow. So it just can't be color. There are Negroes with blue eyes. And those Negroes, though they be light skinned and have blue eyes, are just as segregated as those who are clearly black and colored. So the only reason we had segregation, Thurgood Marsh said in 54, is an inherent determination that the people who were formerly in slavery, regardless of anything else, shall be kept as near the stage as possible. And now is the time we submit. The court should make clear that that is not what our Constitution stands for. He said that the goal of America, much of it, even after slavery, was to keep the Negro as close to slavery as possible. So the bondage of slavery and the vestiges of slavery did not even end with the 13th Amendment that outlawed slavery. And then we know that because of slavery, there was a civil war that left between 620 to 750,000 soldiers dead, along with an undetermined number of civilians. The Civil War was the deadliest military conflict in American history. Uh, more deadly than all of America's military death from all other wars combined until the Vietnam War. America killed herself trying to hold on to slavery. You can't even have a conversation about Juneteenth till you clearly understand what slavery was and the evil that it was. Well, if that's what slavery is, what is Juneteenth? In the middle of the Civil War, 19, 1863, Abraham Lincoln issued an Emancipation Proclamation. It did not free the slaves. It only outlawed slavery in states in rebellion. That's why, for instance, Delaware was able to keep their slaves because they, they weren't in rebellion. They didn't join the Confederates. And what Lincoln really said, if you just stop fighting, we'll let you keep your slaves. It only ended slavery in the states that were in rebellion. And every state in rebellion got the message except Texas. Texas didn't let the slaves get the memo. And it wasn't until June 19, 19, 1865 that 250,000 slaves got the message about the Emancipation Proclamation. And one of the reasons that they got it late is because in, even when Abraham Lincoln issued the Emancipation Proclamation, if a state didn't have a high number of Union Army members, to, to protect the slaves, they, many of them still could not walk off the plantation. Now, Juneteenth is not the date that slavery ended. That is not Juneteenth. I hear people saying that. The date that slavery officially ended by law in America is December 6, 1865, when, it was, when the 13th Amendment was finally ratified. Actually, the 13th Amendment was passed in January of 1865 but it was not ratified by all of the states, enough states until December 
1965. And this was after President Lincoln had been shot and assassinated. And so if that's what slavery is, and that's what Juneteenth is, I want to suggest that by celebration may not be the best name. Now, I'm not against celebrating. But, you know, we don't really celebrate even things like Memorial Day. You know, they go and lay a reef. They go and lay a reef. I want you to know that the slaves that heard this in Juneteenth, they weren't happy. They didn't just celebrate. Uh, because they and their slave white supporters, the fact of the matter is they wanted more than freedom. Freedom is just a step toward the ultimate goal of dignity, equality, and full citizenship. Because if you can keep somebody in slavery for 240 years and then just one day say, y'all free, no reparations, <laughs> no repair, no 40 acres and a mule, you just have released them from one form of slavery and let them enter into another form of slavery. That is why the slaves and their white abolitionist friends always understood that freedom was a step toward dignity, equality, and full citizenship. So for me, this day must be a commemoration and a reconcentration. And then I want to say that if that's the case, what could make supporting Juneteenth holiday a form of cynical hypocrisy? You know, there's actually a way to approach Juneteenth that is nothing but hypocrisy. Like, you vote, as the entire U.S. Senate did unanimously, for Juneteenth to be a holiday, but you still refuse to pass the For the People's Act that would make voting a holiday <laughs> and it would get dark money out of the voting process. Think about that. You can vote bipartisanship. You don't filibuster for a holiday. And you want everybody to jump and shout and say, oh, it's so great. But at the same time, you are refusing to restore the Voting Rights Act. That's cynical hypocrisy. We have to be careful in this moment. It's one of the reasons I'm really concerned even about how uh, we're turning, too many places are turning Juneteenth over to um, governments because governments don't always want to do things that's going to radicalize people and call them to be who they ought to be. And how can you sign off on so-called Juneteenth bill and then know that people are still in the bondage of greed and the bondage of low-paying jobs, as Dr. King called, working almost um, uh, in, in a way that's a new form of economic tyranny and slavery. But you vote unanimously for Juneteenth, but you stand against it living wages and fight unions. How can you give um, uh, workers like yourselves, particularly uh, nursing care workers and hospital workers, essential, what you call people essential for over a year, but you never give them the essentials that they need. You treat them like they're expendable and you make them literally have to fight and do CD, civil disobedience. And, and then you, you, push, you push forward a, a, a national celebration holiday and say, be happy. That's hypocrisy. How can you say that you care about Juneteenth and you can't pass a bill on police reform when police brutality has been with us forever? I was just looking at a, 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 a Richard Pryor and Red Fox talking about police brutality back in the 1950s. How can you do that? We have 87 million people uninsured or uninsured. And we still have people that are enslaved by the system of not being insured because we still in America, the only one of the 25 wealthiest countries, we're the only place that still says that your insurance is based on your job and not based on your body. This is hypocrisy. It is acting as though all of the vestiges of racism and classism are in the past and they are not in the past. Those vestiges are still with us. Uh, we, you know, in my state, I have a black lieutenant governor who's going around saying that racism is not even an issue. Uh, he's saying that uh, poverty is not really an issue. It's just a 
moral issue of the people, that racism is just something that happens in the backwoods. Well, how is it that you can vote for uh, uh, Juneteenth uh, and yet have millions of low-wage essential workers risk their lives during COVID for a medium pay of $13.48, according to the Brookings Institution, and 20% of them live in poverty and more than 40% rely on public assistance. And if you use the supplemental income uh, measurement, it's more than that in poverty. And, 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 and you know it doesn't have to be this way. You vote to give corporations 86% of all the money that was passed in the first COVID bill, then you cut the second COVID bill, and in not one of the bills do you guarantee living wages, and even do you guarantee health care for all, but yet you say you don't believe, you believe that we ought to remember this day called Juneteenth. The truth of the matter is also, when we look at this Juneteenth, particularly as it relates to black people, too many black Americans today still don't have health care. Uh, more than 5,000 million workers, million workers, 5 million workers who lost their jobs, also lost family health insurance. That's affecting 27 million Americans in this pandemic. And black workers lost jobs at twice the rate of whites. And the racial health insurance gap has drastically widened. Over 12% of black Americans have no health insurance. And when we look at prior to the Affordable Care Act, nearly one in three Hispanic Americans and one in five black Americans, 20%, were uninsured prior to the Affordable Care Act. And some of the people that voted for Juneteenth still want to get rid of the Affordable Care Act. In 14 states, they have refused to expand Medicaid. And still 30 million people remain insured, uh, uninsured that could be insured under the Affordable Care Act. And about 30 million of those are people of color. And more than 90% of the people who don't have insurance because their state didn't expand Medicare live literally in the South. I could go on and on. How can you say that you are really unanimously support Juneteenth and the people finally being freed for slavery when minority voters are six times as likely as whites to wait over an hour to vote? Over an hour to vote. I think that the, the difference is between 10 minutes and 60 minutes. And every day we see more and more laws trying to prevent access to the ballot. Two for the matter is voting actually cost people more in, in minority communities. It costs them more in terms of time and impact. And so here we are with this reality. And to claim to support Juneteenth but refuse to address these realities is a form of, hip, hip, of hip, cynical hypocrisy. And if we don't acknowledge this hypocrisy, it is we are not truly honoring the spirit of Juneteenth. If we don't truly say that everybody in this world, everybody has a right to live, everybody has a right to strive. And if we turn this celebration that some people call it, I call it commemoration, over to the government. And those governments just have music and singing and food, but they don't address the realities in their own, own cities. That's a form of cynical hypocrisy. And if we turn Juneteenth into just a party, a party, and a day off, rather than a day off, day on, that also is a cynical form of hypocrisy. So what then must Juneteenth cause us all Americans a deep conscious to do? Well, I want to suggest to you, 11 SEI, you, you 1199, that this day must make us face today's realities and address the continuing injustices, many of them that have their legacy and roots in the philosophy of supremacy that produced slavery. Now, we don't have physical legal slavery today, but I tell you, we still have much bondage. We got a lot of slavery to greed, a lot of slavery to lies, a lot of slavery to meanness, a lot of slavery to racism, a lot of slavery to economic injustice, a lot of slavery 
to homophobia and xenophobia and inequality. And the truth of the matter is the song says, none of us is free until all of us is free. And so Juneteenth can't be a party. I want to suggest let it be a commemoration and a reconsecration more than a celebration. We can't just let people take it over and we just have a few dances. Remembering Juneteenth must keep us from relaxing or retreating. When we say, I'm going to remember Juneteenth, we ought to be saying, I'm remembering it so that I won't relax or retreat from addressing the issues that we must address today. And we must, it must make us say that until everybody gets the message and everybody gets the memo, because it's been 156 years since Juneteenth. And some people still act like they haven't gotten the message. Some people still act like uh, the white supremacy is all right. Some people still act as though their injustice and their mistreatment of workers and lower wage workers is okay. But we must remember Juneteenth and that remembrance must make us say we will never relax and we will never retreat until everybody has the message. We want one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. And we're never, ever, ever, ever going to accept, accept injustice of any form. And we're going to say they better get the memo. That's what Juneteenth ought to say. They better get the memo because uh, we ain't going to let nobody turn us around because none of us is free until all of us is free. Juneteenth must be about us loving one another better, fighting for justice better, fighting for what's right better. Juneteenth must revive us. It must recharge us. It must restore us. And it must uh, re-engage us. Juneteenth must embolden us and encourage us and enliven us. Juneteenth must push us and propel us and prompt us and prepare us. Juneteenth must steady us and strengthen us and secure us and solidify us. Juneteenth must make us ask the question, which side are you on? Which side are you on? Juneteenth must make us say in the face of continuing realities in this country, if they didn't give up back then, even after being lied about, lied to for more than two years, if they didn't give up then, if they held on, and if afterwards they continued to fight for citizenship and full humanity and dignity, if they did it then, then surely today we must declare, ain't gonna let nobody turn us around from having a third reconstruction in America until every child is educated and every sick person is healed and insured, and every worker has a living wage, and everybody that's experienced racism can see it torn down. Oh, no, 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 Juneteenth cannot be a day off. It must be a day on. And every time we remember Juneteenth, that remembrance must say to us, we never get the privilege of relaxing and retreating until everybody is free. Because then, till then, none of us are free. God bless you. Thank you so much for allowing me to be with you on today. Uh, wow. What, what an absolute honor uh, and privilege for us in 1199 to be graced uh, by your words uh, and, and your vision uh, for justice, Reverend, Reverend Barber. Uh, my name is Rob Burrill. I'm the president of 1199. And I just want to thank you. Uh, on behalf of our 25,000 members, you are the foremost uh, fighter for justice uh, in our country as we seek to, to build uh, for the first time in our country a multiracial democracy. Uh, and you've given us tremendous courage in this most difficult of years. Um, all of the Thank you so much. I look forward to always working with 1199 and all of your, your entities. And I look forward to us in June of 2022, having a mass poor people's low wage workers assembly in Marl March on Washington, June 18, 2022. And I know and believe you'll be mobilizing with us 
as we seek to change this narrative and build power. And you're right, build this multiracial democracy, which is the third reconstruction that has been hoped for, but has yet, yet to be realized. But I believe it's our time to make it so. Yes, it is. And, and we will, of course, be, be uh, privileged to join you uh, in numbers as large as we have the ability to, to join you with. Um, you know, our, our members have been through a lot of suffering and, and pain in some of the most deep, deep ways over the last uh, 15 months. That pain has been physical. It has been emotional. It has been spiritual. The people on this call and all of our members understand uh, what that has felt like. Uh, and, and it continues. Just two days ago, we lost uh, one of our uh, beloved brothers, uh, Garth Herrick, uh, who is a worker with the developmentally disabled. Um, and so I actually just want to have a, a brief moment of silence uh, for Brother Garth. Amen. 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 Thank you. We all, uh, we all have heavy hearts for his two beautiful daughters who are, are now orphans. Um, I want to ask just, just to remember who all of us are on this call. Uh, we are descended from people who uh, were brought to this continent in bondage and chains, whether we were dropped on the island of Jamaica or Haiti or Cuba or Puerto Rico uh, or in these United States. Um, we are the descendants of those who uh, labored, as you talked about, Bishop Barber, in this country for 402 years, uh, uh, half of those years under bondage and oppression and slavery. Uh, but all of us on this call understand what it is to, to have to fight for uh, the most basic rights and dignity. Uh, we are also descended from uh, laborers who came from Italy uh, and worked in, in sweatshops from Puerto Rico and labored in tobacco fields. Uh, and so if we think a little bit about who caregivers are, and we are honest in reflection for just a second. We understand that the face of caregiving, the face of healthcare workers in this country is the face of a black woman. Black women who labor uh, in the master's home, caring for the master's children, caring for the master's wife, caring for the master's parents. And because caregiving is defined as the face of a black woman, all of us, white, black, and brown, who work in caregiving professions, uh, our, our lives have less value. Our work is not respected. Uh, and and uh, our, our communities suffer uh, because we do not have the same rights and privileges as all other people. And of course, we saw that during the course of the pandemic in the most deep of ways when the illness, uh, the lack of protective equipment, and even the death of our members uh, was invisible to the powers that be. 24 members of our union have lost their lives fighting the pandemic, even when we were in trash bags and publicizing uh, the fact that there was no PPE other than a hefty trash bag uh, to keep people safe. Uh, many, in most cases, the powers that be just ignored uh, what was going on. And so Sister Gloria uh, said it so well that the pandemic for many of us is nothing new. Uh, tragically, during the last year plus, millions of essential workers felt what it was like, experienced what it was like, and lived what it was like to be invisible and to have our needs, our rights uh, to be invisible, and our right to life to be invisible. That year of tragedy uh, is something that we all carry with us. And not every tragedy leads to a movement, but I, I think we can say that most movements are birthed in tragedy. Just as we saw last year that the murder of Brother Ahmad, Sister Brianna, Brother George, birthed the most powerful and largest multiracial movement that we've seen in this country with 30 million people, white, black, and brown, coming out in the streets to say that black lives have to matter. We determined in this union to make sure that essential healthcare workers' lives would matter. And so should transit workers' lives matter, grocery workers' lives matter, delivery and postal workers' lives matter. Thousands of them made the ultimate sacrifice uh, as they were attempting to keep us all sick and cared for and fed and well during the last calendar year. 
For us in the union, that meant that we had to mobilize, as the Reverend talked about, to be united enough, mobilized enough, and militant enough that we were ready to strike with 6,000 nursing home workers, with 3,000 group home workers. We were ready to suffer arrest with home care workers and with state workers. And we saw what it looked like to build a real movement in this state for the rights and the dignity of workers, white, black, and brown in the healthcare field. All during that time, of course, we were combating fear. Nobody wants to go on strike. Nobody wants to be arrested, but we saw what happens and what we were reminded of in movements again and again, that together we're stronger than our fear. That together we have the courage to dream dreams that change our lived realities and change the realities for our communities. For us, we define that as a few basic minimum rights, a minimum standard of $20 an hour for caregivers, healthcare for all caregivers, the right to a dignified retirement for all healthcare workers, and of course, racial justice for all caregivers. Part of that was Juneteenth as a holiday, but it went beyond that. It went to making sure that on the shop floor, that none of our members would have to submit to being called a monkey again without bosses being held accountable. That none of our members would have to be racially profiled while they travel from black and brown cities into really white cities, uh, towns and suburbs without their employers having to take a stand with that workforce to recognize that black lives have to matter when dealing with police departments. And yes, to win Juneteenth as a paid holiday for the first time. And we won contracts and victories that really are unprecedented in our union. We went from a budget that allocated $0 for group home workers, $0 for nursing home workers, to about $330 million to move people out of poverty and towards a vision of dignity. It was a reminder of the power that movements have. The movements have the ability to break the chains of exploitation that can translate our dreams into something that can be a lived experience. And what we're asking for really is nothing extravagant. We just want the basics. The rights to live, to laugh, to love, to learn, and to worship as a birthright, not as a condition of, of wealth or privilege. We're really honored, I think, by the courage and the vision of our members during the past year. But as Reverend said, this is the beginning, it's not an end. Bishop Barber talked about Juneteenth not being just a day off, but a day that's a reflection for what freedom means, a day that's a reflection for what ending oppression means, a day that's a reflection upon what it makes to remake our nation and remake our world in light of those dreams that we have but that we can't currently enjoy. But bonded by love in this beloved community that we are together constructing brick by brick and wall by wall, I know that together we will win this struggle to breathe for the first time in our country, the fresh air of democracy. I love all of you. I know we love each other. And thank you for coming together. And thank you to Reverend Barber for uh, your words, your inspiration, and your leadership. One love. Thank you all. This concludes uh, this event with Reverend Barber and 1199. Enjoy June 19th and keep fighting.